It did not rain in Eugene on October 16, 1876. The day the State University of Oregon opened its doors was clear and warm. There were no ceremonies to mark the beginning, no processions, no speeches by the people of Lane County who had given the university to the state. Neither local nor state politicians showed up for the occasion. The university's president offered no promises and shared no vision of his goals. Instead, President John Wesley Johnson simply began registering students. More than 100 prospective students lined up to be examined for entrance and classification that first Monday. More students arrived all week. Soon, 155 had registered and classes were underway. It was an austere beginning, and it hadn't even started to rain. There were those in the state who feared the university might not survive, and others who hoped it would fail. Oregonians had been arguing about higher education since before Oregon was a state. At the Constitutional Convention of 1857, the delegates had to decide what to do with the federal government's land grant for a state university. Under the Donation Act of 1850, the federal government would give new states 72 sections of land, slightly more than 46,000 acres, for the use and support of a university. Generally, that meant the state could sell the land and use the money for higher education. But most of the delegates of 1857 didn't think Oregon needed a state university. They were led in that belief by the president of Oregon's Constitutional Convention, Judge Matthew Deedy. Deedy, one of the most powerful politicians in the Oregon Territory, would come to change his mind. But in 1857, Deedy believed a university sponsored by the state would be managed in the interest of political factions. The Episcopalian judge feared that an Oregon university would be controlled by the Methodists, not only the territory's dominant religious denomination, but also an exceptionally strong political force. Others in his camp argued that the territory's population was too small to support a public university. Deedee's viewpoint prevailed. The convention voted 27 to 15 to remove the constitutional clause providing for a state university. Then they voted to set aside the university fund so that it could not be spent for at least 10 years. The delegates' attitudes reflected their pioneer culture. Many of Oregon's early settlers had come from Midwest states where public high schools and universities had not yet developed. Higher education was simply not part of their cultural tradition. In fact, most Oregonians had only a third or fourth grade education. For the few who wanted more than that, there were some sectarian colleges, though most did not offer much more than the equivalent of a secondary school education. In the 1850s, the Methodists had founded Willamette University in Salem. The Baptists had established McMinnville, now known as Linfield. The Congregationalists had founded Pacific University, and in Monmouth, the Disciples in Christ had established Christian College. In Eugene, efforts to found a college hadn't fared so well. The Cumberland Presbyterians established Columbia College in 1856. The building burned four days after it opened. The fire was blamed on arsonists, and a congregation deeply divided over slavery. The college was rebuilt, and it was torched again. A third stone building was never used. The Presbyterians abandoned the college in 1859 after the congregation fractured over whether there should be Bible reading and prayer in the classrooms. By 1872, some of the leading businessmen of Eugene were ready to try again. It was a time of growth and optimism. The Civil War had ended seven years earlier. Now the closest conflict was in the lava beds of Northern California, where the Modoc Indians were under siege by the U.S. Army. There were two newspapers in town, one for the Republicans and one for the Democrats. There were five churches. The city's new brass band had started practicing in March, and in April, Eugene Hook and Ladder Company No. 1 had been organized for fire protection. Less than a year before, the ONC Railroad had reached town. Eugene was a city on the move. During the summer, the city's leaders started talking about building a public high school. They set their sights a little higher after they received a visit from Thomas Campbell, the president of Christian College in Monmouth. Campbell had an idea, and he was looking for support. 
Campbell believed the 1872 legislature was finally going to authorize a state university. Campbell wanted the legislature to select his college to be that university. His incentive? He could use the rich, untapped state university fund to run his institution. The Eugene men liked Campbell's idea all right. They liked it so much, they swiped it and shaped it into a proposal for a university in Eugene. In August of 72, the Lane County men formed the Union University Association, the UUA. The first board of directors included Judge J.M. Thompson, Dr. A.W. Patterson, Judge Joshua J. Walton, and businessmen Thomas Hendricks, Ben Doris, Will Abrams, and William J.J. J. Scott. By the time the legislature convened in September, the Lane County delegation had prepared a university bill. In exchange for the state declaring Eugene the permanent location of the State University of Oregon, the UUA would build a university worth $50,000 and give it to the state. The building was to be finished no later than January 1, 1874. A board of regents would run it, and it was to be a non-sectarian institution. Religious tests for either students or teachers would be forbidden. Of the four university proposals before the legislature in 1872, Eugene's was the only non-denominational plan. For many lawmakers, that made Eugene their choice by default. If they couldn't have their church run the university, they certainly didn't want any other church running the university. The legislature narrowly selected the Eugene proposal over those of Albany College, Christian College, and Pacific University. The UUA went to work, and at first, things went smoothly. By January, the UUA had selected a marshy five-acre site near the center of Eugene. In March of 1873, the UUA requested bids for 600,000 bricks for the building, and it was well on its way towards raising $50,000 for the project. Lane County had voted to contribute $30,000 with a bond issue. That left only $20,000 to be raised through private donations, and people were already stepping forward with their pledges. The first problem was the location. The Board of Commissioners for State Lands, consisting of the Governor, the State Treasurer, and the Secretary of State, hand-delivered a velvet-covered threat to the UUA on April 21st. In it, they pointed out that while they didn't have the power to designate a site for the university, they would have to approve it before the state would accept the building. Then they spelled out their requirements. The university should be on high ground to facilitate drainage. The drainage of the university cesspool should not affect any nearby wells. And the site would need an abundant supply of good water. They pointed out that land offered by the Reverend J.H.D. Henderson would satisfy their concerns completely. The UUA met that night and, not too surprisingly, decided to build on the Henderson property. Henderson donated part of the land for the university and charged $100 an acre for the rest of it, 17 and 3 quarters acres of land about a mile east of Eugene, just across the road from the old McMurray place. The next problem was money. The Panic of 1873 had launched a nationwide depression. Money was scarce, crop prices were down, and as tax time rolled around in Lane County, the $30,000 bond issue for the university became an easy target. Opponents said the university would serve only the wealthy, and they called for its relocation to another community. The university's supporters argued that Eugene needed the economic development opportunities a university would bring. They said land values would increase and wealthy tax-paying families would move to Eugene to educate their children. They argued that having a university nearby would elevate the moral standards of the community. The groundbreaking went ahead as scheduled May 7th. On May 10th, Lane County rescinded the $30,000 university bond issue. With the majority of their funding gone, the UUA swallowed hard and three days later went ahead and awarded the brick contract. The magnitude of that decision is remarkable. Consider these numbers. There were 1,100 people living in Eugene in 1873, just 220 families. 140 subscribers had pledged $15,000 to at least start the construction of the University of Oregon. Those who couldn't give money offered their skill their labor, or even a portion of their crops. 
the Gillespies, Grays, Lempels, Scotts, and Richardsons, among others, gave bushels of wheat. Isaac Zumwalt gave $17 and a cow. John Thompson offered money and two cords of wood. And in June, Daniel Norris walked in a mare for which the university received $80. The ladies of the Episcopal Church raised $37.50 at a benefit. It all counted. The building started going up. The UUA could only pay for day labor and building materials. They had to postpone paying for the land, the iron, the contractors, even the services of the architect. Even with that, by the fall of 1873, only the basement and outer walls were finished. Before the rains destroyed the building, UUA director Ben Doris raised the money himself and installed a roof. The 1874 legislature gave Eugene a two-year extension, so the UUA went back to fundraising. A countywide campaign raised $6,000 in cash. The Lane County Grangers donated wheat worth another $6,000 there still wasn't enough money. Most suppliers were now taking cash only. Judge Walton was paying the bills for the UUA. If he had no cash on payday, he would leave his law office and go out into the country looking for donations. In later years, people remembered him coming into town carrying a box of apples or leading a calf or some pigs. He would take the goods to friendly store and sell them so that the workmen could be paid. Towards the end, school children went door to door collecting money to pay for the glass in the windows of the building. In the spring of 76, enough of the building was finished to hold classes. Before it could be transferred to the state, some of the unpaid contractors filed a $5,000 lien against the building. UUA director W.J.J. J. Scott personally paid those bills. It would be a long time before he and several other creditors got their money back. In July, the state inspected and accepted its new state university. Architect William Piper had designed the university building in the Second Empire style. The building stood alone on a bare hill, save for two old oaks just to the north. There were six finished classrooms on the first floor. The ceilings were 16 feet high. The floor was two feet thick, a wooden sandwich filled with earth, designed to muffle sound and preserve heat. Wood stoves could uh, radiate heat, it would be absorbed by the earth and, and maintain a kind of even heat throughout the day and night. So, Pretty innovative for its time. And pretty heavy. The brick bearing walls at the bottom of the building were three feet thick to handle the weight. The exterior was red brick made with clay excavated from a hill a mile south. And it was a good clay but not terrific clay. Uh, the bricks that were made from it were good bricks but not terrific bricks. In fact, the bricks started to disintegrate in the rain. Within 15 years, they would need to be coated. Kind of a waterproofing. It was a process done at that time called parging, which is like a waterproof stucco. The Board of Regents met in early August. Matthew Deedy, now a U.S. District Court judge, had become the board's president. Judge Walton was the secretary. The regents passed bylaws and elected a faculty of five. The opening day was set. Advertisements were published in newspapers throughout the state. There would be two 20-week terms in the school year. College tuition was $20 a term, with an incidental fee of $2.50. Preparatory school tuition was $15. By the middle of October, the city was filling with students. Nearly half of them would enroll in the prep school. The university had to offer these high school classes that's because in 1876 there were only two public high schools in Oregon, one in La Grande, the other in Portland. Of the private academies, few were suitably preparing students for college entrance. The university itself offered a classical education patterned on the traditions of Yale and Harvard. Students took Latin, Greek, mathematics, philosophy, and science. There were no electives no lab experiments for science, no modern languages, no literature classes, and no athletics. The emphasis was on composition and the recitation of memorized facts. The idea was to discipline the mind of the student, not necessarily teach them useful information. 
The curriculum suited President John Wesley Johnson perfectly. He himself was a graduate of Yale, and he was teaching what he had learned the way he had learned it. Johnson was 40 years old when the university opened. He'd been the president of McMinnville Baptist College and the first principal of the Portland High School. He was a short man, known for his severity, sarcasm, common sense, and dry wit. He was not only president of the university, but also the professor of Latin and Greek. In a recording made in 1954, a graduate of the class of 1893 remembered Johnson for his toughness. The students all had a great deal of respect for J.W. Johnson because of his ability as a teacher and also because of his strictness and sternness. He just simply did not permit any frivolity and he had no use for any student who didn't have his lessons. The townspeople generally liked him. He hunted, fished, enjoyed an occasional beer and the frequent use of tobacco. There was a box stove in his room. He'd sit in front of that box stove even when class was in session. And he'd spit in the, in the stove. The professor of mathematics was Mark Bailey. The six foot three Baptist minister had graduated from Brown University. He was theologically conservative, passionate about astronomy, and not as tough as Johnson. He was very severe with these students in his uh, mathematics and astronomy classes, very severe with them, but he was much more kindly. Thomas Condon was the professor of natural sciences. The diminutive Irishman had graduated from the Auburn Theological Seminary and was ordained a congregational minister. Condon came to Oregon in 1853 as a missionary for the pioneers. Condon was also a scientist. Geology and the study of fossils fascinated him. Eventually, he wrote a book on the geology of Oregon, most of it based on his own research and discoveries. He was well known throughout Oregon as a lecturer. He had reconciled for himself Christian theology and the theory of evolution, and he spoke eloquently on the subject. He was by far the best known of the faculty members out in the state, so that uh, attracted uh, students. He was gentle, kind, and genuinely interested in his students, and they loved him. Condon, by far, was uh, the uh, most friendly to his students. The students had a, a column that they wrote, and Condon was more frequently mentioned than any of the others, and oftentimes for his kindness. The principal for the preparatory school was Mary Boise Spiller. She had graduated from Mount Holyoke and was described as being severe but thorough as a teacher. Spiller was the sister of Reuben Boise, a colleague on the federal bench with Matthew Deedy. Spiller's assistant was Mary Stone, a graduate of St. Helens Hall in Portland. She was Judge Deedy's niece. He wrote in his diary that he supposed the regents had selected her as a compliment to him. She only lasted a year. President Johnson's salary was set at $2,500 a year with Bailey and Condon to receive $2,000 each. Mary Spiller was hired at $1,200 a year and Mary Stone, $800. The pay was respectable for the time and the positions, if only they'd received it. It soon became apparent that the state's management of the university fund had been a farce. The state land board had sold much of the land grant acreage for a fraction of its worth and then loaned much of what they got for the land without requiring any security. After his own investigation, Judge Matthew Deedy reported to the legislature that there should have been $200,000 in the fund. There was only 66,000. Such pillaging wasn't against the law at the time. Judge Deedy changed that with the University Act he drafted and pushed to the legislature that year. In the future, fund loans would be carefully approved and secured. But in 1876, the new university was in a financial bind. The interest from the land-grant fund would yield only $3,500. Tuition payments wouldn't help much, since nearly a third of the students had state-mandated full scholarships. So the regents balanced the budget at the faculty's expense. By the end of the year, they had withheld $1,000 of the president's pay, $500 from both Condon and Bailey, $300 from Spiller, and $200 from Stone.
the legislature appropriated ten thousand dollars to finish the upper levels of the university building but did nothing about the faculty salaries in early 1878 the regents rewrote the faculty contracts officially reducing their wages by 20 percent the faculty would wait 11 years until 1887 to be restored to the pay scale they had originally been promised. The college students had other things on their minds, classes, of course. During the winter months, if students didn't have a class scheduled during a period, they ended up in the hall. It was too far to go back to town and usually too wet to go outside. And if they talked to each other in the hallway, and they usually did, the noise they made would interrupt classes. Then the wrath of President Johnson would fall upon them. He lectured Young them women. weakly about the noise. He herded them into his office and made them stand silently. He threw water on them. None of it worked. Within two weeks of the beginning of classes in 1876, the students formed debating societies. The faculty allowed them the use of the recitation rooms on Fridays for their separate meetings. The women called their group the Eutaxians. The men organized the Lorians. They were far more than debating societies, though they did worry over wonderful issues such as the future of the Republic, the necessity of morality, the value of unions, and the wisdom of public power. These societies were, for a time, the unofficial representatives of all the students. They petitioned for a gymnasium, for theater, for a school paper. They were usually turned down. When the students could not have drama on campus, they put on plays with the people in town. When they couldn't have their own paper, they wrote columns for the city papers. The students brought the first library to campus. The Eutaxians and Lorians bought the books from a failed Eugene library and installed them in their meeting room. The social highlight each term was the joint meeting of the Eutaxians and Lorians. Weeks of planning went into the event. All participants arrived in their finest attire. Needless to say, chaperones were present. The faculty had established rules for student conduct. They came to be known as the Ten Commandments. Students were forbidden to enter a saloon, drink alcohol, smoke, or swear. They couldn't talk in the halls, block doorways, stay out after 11, or go to public dances. The regents decided women could only use the university's east staircase, the men only the west. The regents worried that the women's ankles might otherwise be seen as they climbed the stairs. Most of the students lived downtown. They paid three to four dollars a week to lodge in a private home or slightly more to live in a boarding house. It was about a mile to the university from downtown Eugene, and that wasn't a problem unless it rained. When classes began in 1876, the city still hadn't started building a sidewalk to the campus. Now, it rains in Eugene. A lot. Before there were sidewalks and pavement, there were mud holes. According to a Roseburg newspaper account in the 1880s, rain turned Willamette Street into a sea of quivering mud. Mud as thick as a boarding house custard and about the same color. An historian of the time related a story about Eugene's quagmire, reporting that it is of so fine a quality and so deep that two hogs rooting in the streets sank out of sight to be forever lost to view. We can only hope the story was apocryphal. We know the mud was not. Even after the wooden sidewalk was completed in December of 1876, it needed tending. If it had been scraped with shovels, it was passable. If not, pedestrians might find themselves wading through six inches of mud. When the students got to school, they picked up firewood and carried it in for the stoves heating their classrooms. The university burned 46 and a half cords of wood the first year alone. Lighting came from kerosene lamps. Privies lined one outside wall of the university. It would be 17 years before there would be indoor plumbing and 21 years before the building was electrified. Oregon's first class graduated in 1878. Four men and one woman received their diplomas from Judge Deedy. Nellie Condon, the professor's daughter, was the valedictorian. Deedy was the speaker. He advised the class to promote learning, restrain the strong, protect the weak, fight evil, and practice politeness. The university started to grow. 
In 1878, the university hired John Straub to teach modern languages. Physics professor George Collier came to Oregon the next year. He and his wife built a lovely home on the east edge of the campus. Things were looking up for the university until the sheriff threatened to sell the building during the summer of 1881. The Union University Association debts had come back to haunt the campus. With the association no longer in existence, but many of its debts still unpaid, creditors had successfully sued the state. On appeal, the Supreme Court had upheld the judgment against the university. Slightly more than $8,000 was owed. It was fundraising time again. Within a month, Eugene donors had pledged $3,400. The faculty had pledged more than half of that total, and it still wasn't enough. Rescue, when it came, was unexpected. Judge Deedy received a telegram from his friend Henry Villard. The New York financier and president of the Northern Pacific Railroad had read about the university's financial embarrassment. He offered his help. Villard paid off $7,000 of the debt. Eugene's citizens paid off the rest. The building was finally, truly debt-free. Villard announced more contributions, $1,000 for a library, $1,000 for scientific equipment, and five $50 scholarships. Villard also thought the university should offer English literature, so he pledged to pay the salary of a professor to teach it. He wasn't finished. A year later, he gave the university a $50,000 endowment, with two conditions that the state of Oregon begin contributing at least $5,000 a year to help support the university, and that the university spend at least $400 a year on books for the library. The State Journal reported on Villard's visit to campus in 1883, during which he very pleasantly corrected President Johnson when he mispronounced his name as Villard. It does not, he said, rhyme with Willard, and the D is not pronounced. The accent is on the last syllable. It's Villar. Other than the newspaper article, there is no evidence that anyone else was paying attention that day. Even in 1883, there were critics who thought Villard helped the university only to shape a more positive public image for himself. But there was no denying that his generosity had finally put the University of Oregon on solid financial footing. The future looked bright.